Hi everyone. Today we're going to be going over some new additions to my 3D printer. The ability to use pens, engravers, potentially lasers in the future. Looking forward to that one. Um, but yeah, I'll show you how I did it here in just a sec. So I got a wild hair and decided to convert my 3D printer to not only do 3D prints uh, with filament, but to also be able to engrave into wood or plastics uh, and also be able to take away the, the copper layer from circuit boards. Uh, that was my primary desire. Uh, before, to do a circuit board, a custom made circuit board at home, you've got to use acids and etchings and all kinds of, of uh, rigmarole to be able to, to make your own circuit boards. It's kind of a pain in the butt. It's a long, tedious process. But with how I do my circuit boards, with usually with Photoshop or Illustrator, I can then take that picture and be able to tell the 3D printer to engrave that out instead. And it takes like 10 minutes. It's fantastic. Uh, so I'll show you one of the first things I did. There we go. I wanted to make sure that I could use a pen first. Uh, the 3D printer uh, holding a pen versus holding an engraver, there's very little difference other than weight. Uh, but if something went wrong, which it did a couple of times, then I'd rather the pen was causing the problems and not the engraver. Uh, the engraver being much heavier and able to do more damage, yeah, it didn't, didn't need that. So anyway, I started out with this. Let me show you a blown up version here. And this is the, the final product of the little minion guy here. This was the first go around after I worked out a couple of bugs and got the, the bed height just right and all that jazz. You see all the different lines. Um, in Cura, you can tweak it to where it doesn't show a lot of those lines by using Z-Lift. Uh, I made mine, I think, uh, five millimeters. So every time it goes from one area to another, it lifts the, the pen or the engraver up five millimeters and then moves over and that way it doesn't have all these lines. You can still see a couple of lines just because I was lazy essentially and uh, didn't make it uh, cleaner in Cura first. And I'll show you all that here in just a second. Something else I did is made this guy right here. This is what it looks like when you engrave on wood. So I use that same image of the minion, and instead with the engraver this time, I went ahead and, and carved this into the wood. So I thought that was pretty fantastic. And it's only, I don't know, maybe half a millimeter uh, in depth. And I went fairly slow, so I didn't have any problems, any binding up or anything like that. Uh, but the result's pretty nice. And then this here is the first etching that I made onto an actual circuit board. So not too bad. I probably cut a little deep, and uh, I messed up in Cura as well. Uh, when I told it the size of the um, the extruder uh, tip, I should have told it bigger than I did. I, I put it at 0.1, I think, and I should have t uh, told it uh, the same size as the actual engraving tip, uh, which is probably 1. Um, so that way I would have been able to use the math and make the G-code uh, correct and uh, wouldn't have bled over into the, uh, the little etchings here in these grooves. So it's not bad. It's pretty good. I just didn't want to waste any more boards until I had something I actually wanted to, to do. Uh, this is just a kind of a lame little uh, 555 timer LED uh, circuit. Uh, that I found on the internet, uh, just something quick and easy. But it, uh, it was a proof of concept, and it looks like uh, I'm darn close with getting that to work. So this here is the engraver in. This is actually a flex shaft for a Dremel. I just happen to have a Dremel, so I decided to use the flex shaft uh, attachment. I think it was like 30 bucks over at Lowe's. But uh, I printed this guy out right here, this wood model 
Um, and this right here, this black part, this is the end effector that I bought over at Cine CNC. Uh, it's the exact same one that comes with the printer, uh, my Rostock Max uh, version 2. I just bought another one so that way I didn't have to take the extruder and the fans and all that stuff off of the existing end effector. I could just keep this one on here and swap them out. These right here are the, uh, what you use to be able to plug the arms in. Uh, it makes it really easy to swap them out. In fact, I just swapped, took this one off and put on the my normal 3D printing one. It took me, I don't know, less than a minute. It was fantastic. So this right here is a diamond plated bit. The smallest one I could find at Lowe's. I think we got some other ones running around here somewhere. So I'll uh, look to see if I can find them. Uh, the rubber band was actually quite unnecessary here. I used it for the uh, pin to hold it in place and then I just never took it off. Uh, this actually holds together pretty well oops, with just friction. You see how this is kind of a, a rubber material, rubberized material, and with the wood here, for whatever reason, it grips really good. I didn't have to uh, um, secure it any other way when it was engraving and, uh, and drawing the etching. Uh, it just stayed in place, and I wasn't pushing down very hard either, which made a big difference. And when I was running the Dremel, I ran it at full speed the entire time. Noisy little bugger, too. Uh, but it worked like a champ. Zero problems. Um, but you can see how I've got it. I had to drill these holes. And I, I got this over on Thingiverse. I'll have to link to it in the video. But uh, just drilled a couple of holes with a bench press to match up with the end effector holes here. And secured it as best I could. I didn't have enough screws to to go into these guys, but I, it wasn't really all that necessary. This isn't doing a whole ton. Um, if I was using it for more uh, than what I've done so far, I'll, I'll get some more screws and make sure it's not going to be a problem in the future. But uh, really nice stuff. This, this wood uh, filament's really nice. It costs a bit more than regular filament, um, but super nice stuff. I still got some sawdust from when I was doing my engraving. So yeah, Dremel, definitely a good thing to get. This is Hatchbox filament from Amazon, and it's their wood product. It says the uh, temperature you can have, um, the extrusion temperature, you can have it anywhere from uh, 175 to 250 C. Uh, I want to say I had mine at 230, I want to say. Uh, extruded very well. Uh, it does have a bit of stringing just because I guess the, the wood filaments uh, because of the fibers embedded into the PLA, they do tend to string uh, quite a bit, uh, but easy to clean off. Um, usually with a, a knife or something along those lines, it just comes right off without any problems. It's really pretty decent stuff. So with that out of the way, I'll show you a video of drawing with a pen. This is actually the first test I did uh, drawing a circuit. I actually had the image inverted, but get the idea. There's the ballpoint pen right there. I just had it rubber band directly to the the printout I had. This worked fairly well. The rubber band was really nice because it uh, provided a little bit of bounce. So it wasn't like embedding itself into the, the build platform. It, it kind of had some slack to it, some bungee to it. But that worked very well. I might have to draw some more things in the future just because it was so neat. And then here you can see it etching the actual circuit board. Does a really nice job. So now I bet you're wondering how I did it. Easy enough. First, I went to Google, typed in uh, minion black and white, and found an image. Okay, here's what that little minion looks like after I sucked it off the inter internet. Just black and white, just the lines are uh, black and, and everything else is white. That's all you need. Okay, now we're in Cura. And I'll show you some of the settings first. Uh, of course, yours is probably going to be a little bit different, but this is so far, based on my limited testing, this is what's worked for me. Uh, so layer height, shell thickness, all that jazz. 
Uh, the important things, nozzle size being one millimeter in this case for mine, I made it uh, 0.4, I guess, before, and uh, it was too small, so it had to do more work uh, to make the etchings onto the circuit board. And because of that extra work to, to make the width correct, it actually bled over into the other areas, which I didn't want. So with the nozzle size being one millimeter, which is closer to what the actual bit size is, uh, it shouldn't bleed over like it did. So I might have to tweak this in the future, but I didn't get the idea. Uh, machine settings, this is the my machine settings for being a, a Rostock Max-D2. Uh, unchecked heated bed, uh, one of the times I did a test, I had the heated bed turned on and uh, it actually heated up the bed and the extruder for some reason, even though I didn't even have it plugged in. Uh, so I wanna make sure to uncheck some of this stuff. Uh, extruder count being one and all that. This too, uh, with the uh, Rostock Max, it had to be on the RepRap uh, Marlin for some reason. It was on uh, the Ultimaker code originally and that just kind of goobered things up. So the RepRap worked for me. So hit OK. And then make sure that your temperature for your uh, print speed can be, this is how fast you're gonna go. So 30 was fine with a, with a pin. In fact, faster probably would've been fine. Uh, but 25 is what I used when I was doing the actual engraving with the Dremel. Um, reading temperature, of course, is zero. We don't want to heat up the extruder when it's not where it's supposed to be. Um, and then let's go down to expert settings. This is something else to be mindful of, this area here, the Z-Hop. So that's how far the extruder or the uh, engraver at this point or the pin is going to lift up every time it starts a new section. So I had mine at five, probably overkill. It could have been uh, lower, but I wanted to make sure it cleared that area. Skirt, zero. Don't need any kind of skirting. Don't need any kind of cooling, of course. Um, no infill uh, lines for uh, support uh, type. I don't know if it would make any difference whether it was on lines or grids, but I just went with lines. Um, no black magic, uh, brim as small as possible, no raft, zero for raft, uh, pretty much as, as minimal as you can get it. Now let's go ahead and import in that minion. Now here for height, this is height off the build platform, so we want to go as small as possible. Let's go just 0.5, and then we'll tweak with it after that. Everything else you could pretty much leave the same. Darker is higher, meaning that when Kira looks at this image, it's going to make the black lines of the black and white image rise up. And the white, of course, is going to stay flat. Let's go OK. Give it a second to do its thinking. Ah, there we go. OK, so this is what he looks like. And you can see how the lines have been raised up. Pretty ingenious stuff, this Kira. So, we don't need it to be 0.5, so let's scale that part down. In order to scale down, you want to make sure this uniform size is unlocked. Let's just try 0.5 right now, and how you know if you can get it right is by going to Layers. And so, nope, it's a little too much. Let's go to 0.6. It'll redo it. Ah, there we go. We've got some of it now, just not everything. So let's go to 0.7. Yeah, that looks a lot better. Looks like we might have to go a bit more. You can see the toolpath. In fact, if you tilt it, you can see how it's hopped up that five millimeters and then comes down, does the drawing in red and continues on. Let's see what difference it makes with the 0.8. And we've just given ourselves another layer. And that's not any better. I think 0.7 was the ticket. Yeah, that'll do.
And so you got to make sure your images that you're doing, that you're going to be drawing, are very clear. You don't have any uh, little black artifacts or gray going on because it'll mess up things. Now, this is a pretty clean image. It has some stuff specifically around the border. Uh, but for testing purposes, it worked out really well. Uh, so this looks like what I want. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll save G code and just save that wherever you can grab it with your printer, usually onto a, a memory stick, or you can send it directly from Cura if that's how you've got things set up. I personally use Matter Control for mine. Uh, it seems to work the best for me anyway. Um, and that's all there is to the software portion. Another option for converting your images from black and white into a 3D model is Matter Control's image converter. It does cost $15, so it's not free like Cura's is, uh, but it does work really, really well, and it's very elegant in its design. You purchase it, and uh, it automatically enables itself in Matter Control. Then all you have to do is uh, upload your image. It'll convert it automatically into a model. Here's the Minion uh, photo that I uploaded. I adjusted the height uh, to as low as possible, and there's the actual model right there, ready to be printed. And there the guy is being uh, pinned onto a piece of paper. Here's a more complex model I thought would be more fun. This photo ended up perfect, drawn out on the printer. So that's how it's done. That goes from a black and white image all the way to G-code and then making its way to the printer where it is actually printed with a pen or printed with an engraving device of some sort or eventually a laser if that's your fancy. So not too difficult, it took me probably half a day to get it right. Uh, I'm pretty pleased with the results. Uh, more plain to be had but uh, definitely worth doing. I'm going to attach the uh, Thingiverse link to the different models I've used to help me out. Um, pretty simple stuff. Look how light this is. Really helps out with your 3D printer not having to haul around a bunch of weight. Uh, so, hope you enjoyed this. Leave a comment, leave a thumbs up. Let me know how I did. Thanks. Bye.